So welcome, Dominic, to pull up a chair and thank you for joining us today. I want to start uh, by talking about sustainable growth. Um, and you've written lots around role of business and society, leadership, um, global trends, Asia specifically as well. But back in 2011, you wrote an incredibly interesting piece for the Harvard Business Review. And I was just wondering if you would, for our audience, just share a bit about what sustainable growth means to you. Great. Well, first of all, it's wonderful to be on your on this program or show. I have to go. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm glad you brought up that <clears throat> that article because that was really, it was focused on where is capitalism? And, you know, I was at McKinsey at the time and it, McKinsey gets called a lot of, you know, nasty names at times. But one of the ones I liked was we were known as the Jesuits of capitalism. And so I thought it would be important to write about it. And I just moved from Asia to uh, the UK, actually to London. And one thing I noticed was some differences in capitalism, the short-termism in Ang mm -hmm. and what I call Anglo-Saxon capitalism, um, less inclusive, um, you know, it's winner-take-all type of a, an approach, um, and less owner-driven. And that's not how capitalism was, you know, formulated, if you, mm -hmm. if you go back. And I, to your, just to get to your question, um, you know, I think some progress has been made, but a long, we have a long way to go. I think on the inclusive side, I think there's been some very significant shifts recently on the whole ESG front, stakeholder capitalism, yeah. thinking about, and which is, by the way, very consistent with, with, with profit maximization. You are not a profit maximizer if you don't take care of your stakeholders over time. But I think the ESG, we can talk more about that. I think that is, there's been a step change, even as much as there's lots of challenges right now, it's a step change from where it was in uh, 2010, 2011 on the stakeholder side. On the inclusive part, I just don't think we've made very much progress. Income inequality is worsening. And that's not good for capitalism. If you, if you want to be, you know, I always go back to the Adam Smith mm -hmm. quote, it's the duty of the entrepreneur to take care of the society in which they operate. That's a very, you know, non-Milton Friedman, you know, hard right view. That's a, that's a, you take care of the society in which you operate. And he wrote that in his theory of moral sentiments, you know, and, and I don't think we've made much progress. In fact, I think we've gone backwards um, on, on that side of it. On the owner led, I think, I think there has been some progress by owner. It just means in my view that there's, you know, that there's, there's interested active shareholders. And I think we are seeing that. I think you know, I think BlackRock, I think a number of Vanguard, other, there's been, they're influencing, I think. Mm -hmm. I think they're finding it challenging because they're getting a lot of pressure from multiple sides of, of the argument on the ESG side. Uh, but, but, I, so that, but I think it is, there is a more active role that is being played by owners of the capital. Pension funds are playing a more significant role. Uh, but we've got a long way to go. You know, you've had, um, you, you've been involved in this space for many years, as you've said. You really are clearly driven by profit with purpose, you know, and you are chair of Leapfrog Investments, right. which again, you know, focuses on inclusion as part of the Absolutely. impact that you have. And in October 22, you were recognized as pioneer in transformational impact. What a title. Um, by the Financial Times and International Finance Corporation. So that obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're putting it into practice. And you're also involved in the focus in capital and long-term um, global as right. well. But it took, pick it up on LeapFrog. What is it about LeapFrog that really attracted you to that mission? And how are you seeing that really driving the agenda around inclusion yeah. too? It, I mean, I'm very excited by it because it's, it's, uh, it, it, it truly, it's, it's impact or it's the purpose of it. And it's focused on emerging consumers. I mean, we have four and a half billion emerging consumers in the, on the planet and particularly on the billion at the bottom of the pyramid, the Prahalad work, which is wonderful work, and how we help that consumer group be included in our economy. And LeapFrog, it's a private equity firm, so it, it is focused on earning good returns for shareholders, but its purpose is around ensuring quite a, a, a challenged group of people who mm. are often not in the economy can become part of it. So the core has been around financial inclusion. So that's bank accounts, it's insurance, um, 
it's credit, and then it's healthcare, it's health services for people. Um, and that's, you know, if we can, anything we can do to help that uh, huge proportion of the planet be part of our economic system, the capitalist system, is I think a wonderful thing to do. And I think a more sustainable way of doing it is if it's not aid, it's yeah. you've got to earn good returns. So when we talk to investors, it's basically saying, please give us the money so we can invest it, but we are here to, we're doing good, but we're going to get a good return. It's not 40, 50, 95% of the conversation on impact. It, it's 95% on on the returns that are going to then deliver this impact for, for people. So I'm really excited. And it's in, you know, it's in Africa, it's in India, South Asia is the kind of the, the area. And there's amazing companies that are being built. Med Genome just won an award uh, with the FT. I, I could I go on about it, but I'm really excited because of the scale of what it can do and the fact that it's leveraging capitalism but it, yeah. to, do, to do this work. So... Really exciting. Yeah. So talking about scale and leveraging, the um, the FL, FCLT Global, a not-for-profit organization that really is about focusing capital for long-term growth and sustainable growth right. and prosperity for all. Um, and I think it, you know, it really sort of plays to the leveraging and scaling of, of power. You talk about asset owners and the influence they have. You've got an incredible group of like-minded business people right. and asset owners are really part of that movement. Can you just talk a little bit about what what you know what the um the expectations are of this group of individuals who are really looking to long term economic growth? Yeah, it, it I mean it actually started for there was Mark Wiseman when he was at the at CBPIP who when I wrote that article in 2011 he he was excited by it but then he said so what? Yeah. Like what what's like good, you know, bully for you, you wrote an article, who, who cares? Like what ha what's happening? And he said, let's do something. Let's, let's get, let's get owners of the assets and the whole value chain. We want to get the sort of the, the owners of the assets, but, but which pension funds, for example, are, are there. Let's get the, the sort of black rocks, the, the vanguards and so forth of the world that are the asset that are running the money, if, if you will. Right. Um, and then let's take, get the corporates who are actually being influenced, um, and then, you know, uh, uh, eventually help the consumers that are there. But we wanted to get the value chain in the group. So that's why, you know, and KPMG is a, a really important part. They all have, have been all the way through. So we've got pension funds, to, you know, GIC, CBPIP. I, I, actually, the list is now so long, I'm out yeah. of date and where it is. I won't bore you with that mm -hmm. list, but we've got then we had Andrew Leverus, who was at Dow at the time, and felt there was a lot of corporations that, and Paul Pullman, when he was at Unilever, felt very frustrated with the short-term pressure, just quarterly, getting the quarterly results. So how do we get them to be able to influence the asset owners? And asset managers are saying, look, we're, you know, we're in the middle here. Owners are telling us to be long-term, but then they switch us out if we don't deliver results. So let's have a conversation about that. So it was really to get all of the components of the of the of the investment value chain together to say what are we going to do differently and let's get scales and it's a and it's a pretty significant group and then so let's have the dialogue to talk about why there's this breakdown we it's in the interest of the of the asset owners and by the way when you think about it that's pensioners or that's that's our it's individuals it's in their interest for us to be more for example long term or inclusive but what gets lost in translation and what is it that we can do to try and shift that? Um, and so that, that was really the gen genesis. And so it was to get the group to actually activate. Um, you know, at the time there was, we had a lot of activists who, yeah. many of which were sh very short term, which we wanted to, you know, have a voice about what they were doing and why this was disruptive and not helpful longer term. But by the way, not all activists are bad. I, as I said, I think it's like cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, <laughs> but, but a number of the activists have been bad cholesterol. So it's just to point that out and say, look what damage they can be doing. So that, that was really the, yeah. and then it does, it, it has a research agenda. Um, you know, it's got, it, and it has an agenda of how we want to bring people together with, to actually get things done and try and change 
the, the sort of the equation, if you will. How do we how do we have a tighter link between what owners want, which is more long term, all the way down to the corporate, break any of those disc, you know, problems that, that are that are to break them down and understand how we can make it better. It plays to the power of the collective, collective across the value chain. And you've talked about the asset owners all the way through to the investors, right? right. That are yeah. demanding sort of short term results. Yeah. And I think um, the audience will really be looking forward to seeing that research because, you know, we're all grappling with how do you balance these short term demands? Right. And we'll come on to ESG in a minute, but, but also the long term value creation and the sustainable growth that will actually see us through uh, not just decades, but generations. Right? Exactly. That's the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to just explore something slightly different, if that's possible. You were born in Africa, you worked in Europe. Um, you lived in North America and latterly Asia. So you've pretty much observed businesses, business practices across the world. Do you think there is a slightly, di- do you think there is a different understanding around what sustainable growth means a- across different sort of geographies? I do. I, I think it, you know, it, there, and I won't be comprehensive, so forgive me <laughs> on that. But I, you know, I think certainly there is a Scandinavian version of that. I think I think in Scandinavia, not to stereotype it too much, but if I, I think you know again Denmark, Sweden, Norway, there's I think there's been a more inclusive uh model of growth, mm. uh making sure that more people can participate. And that may mean mean that you don't get the extremes in terms of profitability or performance, but you have a it's a healthy system. It's a happier system. And they have very good companies. There's phenomenal companies. And it's not, you know, it, it doesn't, hasn't taken out the performance. It's just a more, I think, a, a more equitable stakeholder model. Um, and, and incidentally, I think a more a happier sort of a society. I think in parts of Asia, I don't want to, Asia's too big to kind of put in one bucket. But if I think about South Korea, I think about Singapore, mm-hmm. Indonesia, um, Vietnam, you've got, and, and China, China's a whole probably separate thing right now, but, uh, but in terms of the long-termism, um, there, that's very strong. And I, I, that, I particularly noticed it when, you know, I'd been living in South Korea for six years and then I was in Shanghai for six years and I moved to London and just meeting a lot of, I was meeting clients when I was at McKinsey and the time frames were what shocked me. I, it was almost like I'd come from a different, it did come from a different world, I guess, but it, but a different world in terms of capitalism, if you will. So I'm, you know, I, when I talk to the chairman of Samsung about what their objectives are mm-hmm. and what they want to try and build, their time frames are just fundamentally different than what I found with an equivalent um, North America mm-hmm. or in Europe, and that surprised. So it, so there, it's more long term. And the one story, not. I bore you with these stories, but I remember I was we were doing work with a Korean president, and it was we had a he had like an economic advisory council, and and when he sat me down to talk about what he was doing, he said, "Let me just give you lay out kind of my vision of what I want the country to be," and he and he he basically said, "I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm laying out a I want a fifty year." vision, right? And and I thought, I, cu- I couldn't get the translation, right? I thought he maybe said 15, because 50 seemed a bit mm-hmm. out there. So I interrupted him and said, do you, you said 50, do you, you read, was it 50 or 15? Because it's probably 15, right? And he said, actually, it's 100. But I know you, you're a, you know, literally called me a, like a white boy from Canada. He called me and he said, you don't know what long term is. So I basically dumbed it down. to Because yeah. I, if I said 100, you'd, and he was teasing me. He said, "You, you, you know, you, you're a, you understand." But their so he, their time frame yeah. is very different. So that that's a other another aspect. I think right now, and by the way, the world changes. But if you look at South America, if I look at Chile right now, it's an, I think it's a very interesting country. There's a you've got amazing companies that are have been built there. It's a very dynamic free market system. But you've now got, uh, because of the in- income inequality in particular, you had the riots that, that were occurring. Po- opinion polls didn't predict those types of things happening. Now there's this constitutional reform. Some people freak out and go, this is going to be a left-wing national. I don't think it's that way. I, don't, I think 
there's a problem that they're all collectively trying to deal with. I, they're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of a, of a capital system, but they're going to be looking for ways to, you know, improve the education system to make sure that people can uh, get the jobs that they need to pension. They're going to have pension funds that actually work to take care of people. There is a role for the state. Mm -hmm. So, so that, by the way, is very different than 10 years ago. But, but the, so I think those are just some, maybe three examples of how yeah. I, I think it's evolving. And in the U S system is probably the hardest on the, you know, black or white thrive or not, you know, you winners, losers, it's extra, you know, it's a, it's the most dynamic, I think of all the economies. And you never underestimate the innovative power and the ability of the system to work, but it, it's extremely unequal. And so you, and that's one element of the, of, I think the underlying challenge that's going on in, in the U S when you just have these gaps. Um, I know there's a lot of other issues too, but it, that's a different, you know, different type of capitalist system. So I do think we have these variations that I think we should look hard to see what we can learn from each of them. Because I, you know, I think Europe, I think Scandinavia could learn from some aspects of the U S system. And the fact of when you deal with a crisis, they, they hammer it, they, they deal with it and they come back no. quickly. Yeah. We're quite slow in, you, you know, in terms of doing restructuring or, you know, so there's something we can learn there. Yeah. I think the U S though could also learn about how Denmark, you know, uh, you know, look at that system, how, society works together, what's the role of business, Germany. So, you know, I think there's some things we can learn because there's not one. There's at least, so I was saying there's probably three or four different times. I just want to turn to your role, your, right. your new big role, should right. I say. I know you've got met yeah. several roles. Um, you joined as chair of Rio Tinto earlier in 2022. Right. And, you know, Rio is, is you know, got operations across the globe, historically, you know, really focused on mining and everybody thinks of mining as all iron, but it's not right. iron. Right. Um, and I know you've been really clear about the mission and the, tra you know, the energy transition and the role that Rio can play and will play. I just wondered if you would, for the audience, just share a little bit sure. about your your vision for what you're doing yeah. with Rio. Yeah. The, the reason on the, I, I was excited to join Rio Tinto is I think the other, for me, selfishly, critical issue that we're facing is climate. That's, mm -hmm. that's existential. You know, we, we're, I, I truly believe we are in the process of making ourselves extinct by what, by what we're doing. And we have to address that. And, you know, the Rio Tinto mission is focused on providing the materials to enable the energy transition. And the energy transition is the fundamental part of dealing with climate change that we have to that's what we have to power. Doing power in a renewable way is critical. And so I can't think of a more important place to work. I want it, it had to be an organization of significance that has the scale, the balance sheet, the talent, the, the DNA, if you will. And so that's what really, that mission is that makes me want to run to work because the, that working on that, by definition, you're doing something that's improving the the planet. It also is an organization that had, has stumbled in the last um, little while, you know, with the, on, you know, again, on some of the areas of capitalism that I'm particularly, you know, mm -hmm. stakeholders with community, you know, blowing up the Jukun Gorge, a 46,000 year old sacred site. That's not, you know, that's not what you do to kind of build stakeholder relations and, and what we, we need to do. The the, the Liz Broderick report on our, on our culture, the bullying, racism, sexual, that's, that's not how you build an organization that's going to lead in what we're doing. But, but the kind of the very bald recognition, complete open, you know, accepting that there is a challenge and, and now we're going to use that to make us fundamentally better because we do have the DNA to, we've done it before. You're clearly Unreal. one for challenges. And <laughs> I think, yeah, talking about the energy energy transition, that is a big challenge. But actually, one thing I do really admire about Rio Tinto was how open you were with that report on your culture. And I just wanted to explore a little bit about culture and its role in sort of delivering the business outcomes that we want, which is inclusion, 
as well as supporting growth. And, you know, for me in particular, it's a really important part of my focus, building right. an inclusive culture uh, that's values driven. And, you know, you let, you laid it all out there. Um, so would you, would you mind sharing a few of, you know, a few of the sure. things that you're doing to start? Yeah. I mean, this is a journey and it'll take time. Right. But could you share a few things that you're doing? Sure. Well, it, I completely agree with you. I, I think culture is the most important thing. I mean, I was at a dinner and the person beside me sort of said, you know, what's the number one issue that you're focused on? And I said, culture. And he, I think he was a bit surprised. He didn't think it was, you know, um, you know, consistent operating performance or yeah. development. It was, I said, culture, because because culture drives everything. And it, that's why, you know, it's the, I'm sorry to say it, the boring, calm, the Peter Drucker phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. And I'm a strategist, but I believe culture is fundamental. And, and, and so what we're trying to do at, on, on the Rio Tinto side is you talk about culture. There's not one culture. A culture has to be appropriate for the company that you're working in. There's obviously basic things of, you know, integrity and, and diversity and so forth that are there. But there are also elements that are important for how the company actually is going to, going to work. So what we are trying to do at Rio Tinto is make sure that the fundamentals are there on, because that report, and I wasn't in the company when the report was published. So it's other, I, I agree with you. They, I think Rio should get a lot of credit. I wished I could say I was, but I wasn't, I joined afterwards, but I think that was a very bold move to put that dirt, if I could call it out there. Cause it's very unpleasant reading when you read that. Uh, it's very, it's very direct, but I think being open about where the challenges are and why culture actually matters to how we operate. If you have a safe environment, and I don't just mean safe from a classic, you're not going to get injured or attacked or whatever. I'm talking about a safe, psychologically safe environment. You're going to get more innovation. Yeah. You're going to get better teamwork. You're, you're going to attract, you know, more interesting ideas to be people to be able to Work. So it's in the interest of our performance that we provide a safe place uh, to be to be able to operate. And I think it's Im it's important to just remind people that these aren't just words on the wall. They're actually they're core to how we be, you know make our business work. It, it helps us be successful. It's not being a nice company for the sake of be. It's because it's core to what we do. And I think. Making sure, so part of what I see, that's just your question about, okay, well, what do I do? I think it, it's just as a board, I think we have to make it the focus so that we are, how are we doing on our cultural journey? As a board, it's, it's a critical topic. And that's often on, on boards, it's not. It's kind of, you've got your risk matrix and we've got strategy and we're going to do succession planning. And I don't know, here, how are we doing on our... Yeah cultural journey? What are the core elements of it? How is the organization feeling? How are we assessing it? But as a board, we're engaging it so that the organization knows it's important and then it's showing up. And then I'm very, I've I, been, because my time in McKinsey too, where values mattered and we had challenges. We made mistakes. We didn't get it right. I spent a lot of time how, focused on how do people learn about culture? What, how do you, you know, and one of the things just on that, just as a Sidebar, it was a real shock or in, shocking insight, or shock and an insight, whatever you want to call it. But it was, we had Nitin Noria, who was the dean of the Harvard Business School, and Daniel Ariely, who, who's written not, not very inspiring books, but things like Why Humans Cheat. And okay. anyhow, their basic message to me was if you want to inculcate values in an organization, there's three occasions in which you will get the maximum impact. Uh, one is when someone joins the first six weeks. That is, it's, you're, you're, you're just, oh, you, you better do, you, what are you going to do? You, you need an intervention. The second is your first promotion. Your okay. first promotion. That's a, it's a, like I've, I've, I've been selected. I've been, so wh what do you do around that? And then the third is when you become a leader in the organization. And that can vary. McKinsey is when you become elected a partner, mm -hmm. you're a leader. So what does that mean? And basically what these two guys said was don't 
waste your time doing a whole bunch of other stuff on the training. Focus on those three. Uh, so it's just, Interesting. again, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not trying to say I'm an expert. At, I've, it's just we have to learn. But mm -hmm. there's so many aspects about culture that we have to get right because it is kind of the secret sauce. If, if you have a good culture, you, you're a more resilient organization. You're all of buzzword. You're more agile. You're more innovative. Um, you, 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 you attract people into the place, you retain people more. So I think getting it right is hard. But it, it, I think your point's exactly right. You, you, what you said, I think, is spot on. It takes a long time. And I used to, when I, you know, would talk to CEOs in my previous role, I had this rule of always asking, you know, what would they teach their 21 years? So what, what would they learn? Blah, blah, that type of thing. One of the things that, that surprised me was how many people said culture is critical, but I figured that out toward the end of my tenure and it was too late because it takes, it, it takes time. And that's why I'm, for example, with Jakob Stossum, who's the CEO, this guy, he didn't read any of that stuff. He didn't, but in his deep, in his bones, it's, he's culture. Like he's yeah. totally culture. And he's that, he focus, even some in board meetings, he'll He's the one that starts off on that to the point of saying, could we actually talk about operating performance? Or he, he always was, let me tell you what's happening. It's usually a problem. This didn't work. I'm trying to do this. This didn't work. But I think that sort of leadership is needed to be able to, like what you're doing at KPG, we need this. It's important. And I'm going to be talking about it a lot. And I'm going to be doing a lot on it. So you got to deal with that. The role of boards has changed yes. from sort of operating performance, financial performance to culture. I'm hearing yeah. more and more people talk about it, not because because you have to keep focus on it. it it's, it's evolving. Right. You know, you're not done with it because right. the reality is, I mean, in an organization like ours, we have 16,000 colleagues, the median age is 27. So wow. decision makers are a generation yeah. older than you yeah. know, a lot of our colleagues. And so you have to be thinking about what, you know, how, in, how colleagues want to work with you. And, you know, you have the same yeah. issue as well. Yeah. You know, you're, you've got 40, 49,000 yeah, colleagues 49, across 000. the world, some yeah. in mine, some in, you know, in, in, right. in sort of professional roles. And so it's a, you know, it, how do you attract and retain a group yeah. of people that, you know, want slightly different things. Yeah. It, it's a really, I find it quite fascinating. Yeah. And I'm sure we could yeah. talk about this uh, again. Yeah. A lot of time. I'm just going to move on to just in terms of the role of boards. And we talked about ESG. Right. And ESG is, um, every time I speak to chairs, the, the approach to ESG is different. And then obviously for someone like you at Rio, you've got all elements of it. You've got the right. E, you've just talked about the S. Is there anything that you've learned from your experience there that you think, oh, that's actually interesting. I'd love to share with people in terms yeah. of how you sort of govern ESG or oversee sure. it. Because the tension between the E and the S all you the time. Total, I mean, that was one of the things that it, it, it's obvious, but it wasn't that obvious to me is that these these are not necessarily congruent, right? There, there's yep. a tension and exactly what you said, the he and the ass. So, um, I, you know, first of all, I, th I think as we were talking before, I think ensuring that that, that, is a, that is a dimension of governance that has to be looked at regularly and frequently with some measures is critical. I, I think for a board, you have to, because it's, it's your license to operate. And, and that's probably how I would try and, bundle it if yeah. I could. You, you, we all need a license to operate and that can go away very quickly if you aren't doing things on the, on the ESG side of it. So ha ensuring that how, how do you, how do you, how do you measure it? I'm not trying to say we're all micro detail people, it's, but it's just assessing how you're doing on, on that front, I think is, is, is very important. And, and then I think it's dealing with some of the conflicts. Yeah. And so we, you know, give you an example, we, we, where the e, the e and the S are conflicting and we have to deal with it. We have to do both. It's not, it's not one or the other, but they, they could be challenged. So we will have often, a, we found, you know, an amazing copper deposit, but there's a, a, a community that doesn't want us to operate on that site where it is. And so you've got a conflict because we need the copper for the decarbonization of what's going to be required. We're short copper, as per my earlier comment, in a mm -hmm. significant way. But you've also got a community that has to live with uh, mine being done on that site. 
So how do you, how do you square that uh, circle? And that's where we have to, that, that's judgment. You need, and I think it's where a board can play a role. It's not an equation. Yeah. And we have to work all the different angles and then we have to make a decision and you have to support the management in making the decision. So I think focusing in on some of these hard areas is key. I think another element is capital allocation. You know, we, we, we put out there last year that we're going to spend seven and a half billion dollars on our decarbonization. You know, Rio Tinto wants to be net zero in 2050. We're going to cut our carbon emissions by 50% in 2030. That takes a lot of capital. So as an investors are saying, you know, we want, we want you to do that, but we also want the returns. And one thing I'm finding interesting, even in only the, what I think I've been in this role for five months now, at the beginning, it was all, that's great, focus on decarbonizing. We love the fact yeah. you put big bull. Now there's a little more, you know what, maybe you don't need to go as hard on that one. And the return, you know, there, there's a, the, the, the return side is picking up, even from some investors who've been strong proponents uh, or talking about being strong proponents on the other side. But again, as a long-term company, I'll go back to the, the yeah. cap. We're a long-term company. We, we are thinking 20 to 30 years out. It's the right thing for us to, to be investing significantly in the carbon reduction. It's, 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 it makes economic sense, even if it might not be we may not have a parade on the street paying people from investors that we're happy to do it now. I know they're going to be happy um, in 10 to 15 years. I am 100% convinced of that. It's just getting through the that part. And that's, again, where I think boards can give confidence and yeah. give support to management that we've got, to, we've got to do it. So it's the focus on it, which we haven't focused, I think, as boards as much in the past. It's how you spend the time in terms of the measures and the, these these challenges. And then I think it's also just providing support to management to be courageous uh, because it's hard in in this world. There's a lot of people that will, uh, you know, get get a, get whack you or, or get upset with it. And I think we just have to keep that long term in mind and push back. I think that's a wonderful way to end the business part of this conversation. Saying no to the hard things yeah. is really difficult to do when it delivers those short-term benefits and gains and sticking and holding your nerve on the decisions that will deliver the long-term vision, which is probably beyond yours and my tenure in our totally. roles, right? Let's be yeah. really clear. Yeah. You know, we're having to make decisions today that yeah. um, you know, we'll see the fruits of um, 10, 20 years down the line. So I think that's a really lovely way to end the business section. I would like to spend just a couple of minutes on some personal reflections. Sure. Um, just because you've got such an incredible career and backstory. If you could go back to, in time, Dominic, and share some advice with your younger self, mm. despite the fact that you didn't like to be managed, yeah. what would that <laughs> advice be? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You didn't mind. Yeah. Um, well, what, one thing that I mentioned before was I would have gone into the public yes. service earlier. Um, I, you know, I was, that's just a sort of a decision because I think I would have been more broad minded and therefore being a better private sector leader because I'd have an understanding, a deeper understanding, I guess, of, of that. Um, the second is, mate, you know, this is strange thing to say, trusting my gut more. You're, I think we all have intuition. I think it's a muscle. It's a mm -hmm. capability that we have. It's hard to analyze it. It's hard to, but it's really important. Your intuition, and there, I've I've found at times like I would I would have a intuition about something, and then, then almost be embarrassed to say anything about it because I had no facts, yeah. I had no analysis, so I'd just be quiet. And sure enough, it would happen. Do, do you know what I mean? You, and there's short-term and long-term, and I think it's, we, I would have written them down. I would have said, you know what, this is what I'm, it, it could be, by the way, even about my career or the work I'm doing or the people I'm working with or what I think are going to be issues. And I think listening and developing that muscle more, I think would have 
made me more effective. I've just sort of realized afterwards. I, I'm not saying I was right all the time. I'm not, I definitely wasn't. But, you know, yeah. what I feel like there's, there was some deep intuitions. And sometimes they were they were worries or they were this, I feel like this is an opportunity or an area. So one area mm-hmm. that where I felt happy about it was moving to Asia. Because at the time, um, you know, that it was night. It was 1992, 1991, I started to get interested in the region, but I'd never really been to Asia. It was just, I didn't really know what it was. I remember the, you know, there was uh, South Korea was desperate for people and no one wanted to move there and no one wanted to go. And it it was getting desperate. It was literally, we need someone to go. And I, it just felt like the, and I went and I, when I got there, all hell broke loose because the financial crisis occurred. So it was even though it was the worst, you know, I didn't know anyone. Companies were going bankrupt. No one knew what, there was no stability. But it was probably one of the greatest growth opportunities for me personally. It was just be, it was jumping into a pool. I felt it would maybe be a good thing to learn how to swim. You know what I mean? I felt there was something there. And I felt like I just flung myself off a diving board and then... You kind of, and there were times I felt like I was drowning and you're scrambling for air, but it was, it was just a massive growth piece. And so there are glimpses of where I said, yeah, that, I, I wish I'd done more of that yeah. at times. So I mean, long-winded way of saying, I think in, I would have got feel, it may be strange for someone like me to say, but I think got feel is a really important part of the management leadership apparatus that I didn't think enough about. We've talked a lot about sustainable growth with this sort of an economic lens, an inclusive societal lens, a community lens, planet lens. Um, you have an incredibly busy life, right? With, uh, with the various right. roles we've talked about, and you are spending time across continents quite regularly. You've just come back from the US. How do you sustain yourself? Energy is really important to me. Like I, I try and manage my energy more than I manage my time because I know myself. I just get interested in things. I, I, I'm not a very good filter of time, but I, what I do know I have to manage is energy. So exercise is really important to me that I can run. I, I, it's just, it's critical. It's like almost a meditation. So one, one at a very practical, very basic level is how I, it's, it's energy, exercise, what I eat. I'm not a fanatic on what I eat, but I monitor how much, how much I drink and how much I red meat I eat or whatever. I just, because I think it affects you, yeah. right? And it, it, affect, it affects your sustainability and, and so forth. And then the other part is this balance is that I'm, you know, it's kind of having a, a full life. And I think if you, it's one of these things, it's not a trade-off actually. That was a, you know, a miss bad thinking on my part. You know, if I work hard, that's good because you'll do better at your work. That's actually not the case. If you are more balanced, you'll do better at your work. And that, I found that very difficult to deal with until I had failures. And that's because I worked in, in that, you know, and at some point, even after 25, you can be in very different places if you're not doing that. Or you become really boring. You work hard, but you're one of those boring individuals on the planet. That's not, you're not going to be effective at, mm. at what you do. And I'm not saying go and figure out how to be interesting. It's have interests. Have interests. So that what I try and do is just on in what I'm doing now is trying to be a little more focused than I have been in the past. So I'm not I'm not doing 19 things. There really only, are only a couple of things that I'm focused on that I'm, when I'm at home, and I'm with my family, I'm 100% on. I'm not looking at my phone as hard as that is, or I'm distracted, or because people, everyone knows when you're not really concentrating. So just be full on when you're, you're doing that. Um, and then it's, to, you know, taking up, making sure there are hobbies and interests of, of what you're, um, you're, you're doing. And right, I'm a big fan of, this may seem very strict, agriculture. I find it, I don't know, and trees fascinate me. I think of a whack job because but it, but there's, so I'm trying to learn more about that. There's people you can talk to just about things that I, that have, have always interested me, but I didn't have time to do it. And making sure you have the time uh, to do that has nothing to do with my work. But in a strange way, I think 
makes me better at my work. I would sum up balance is everything we've talked about today. Yeah. Right? Your personal right. journey. We talked about the different stakeholders and balancing across the, uh, you know, that value chain. We talked about balancing short term, long term. So you've now given me the, the title for this episode, which is balance. That's a, I think that's a, I didn't think about it. I think you're, you're spot on. I agree with you. I think they're in all personal. It is. Business, absolutely. Uh, business, personal, society. everything. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Every time I speak to you, Dominic, I learn so much about general business world and what's going on globally. Your perspectives are just incredibly insightful. So thank you. Thank you for, for joining today. Kind. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.